the perennial market share battle between General Motors Holdens and Ford warmed up a little with the release of the XD Falcon. As we saw last week, General Motors Holdens with their Commodore had stolen a march on Ford by releasing their car some months earlier and immediately capturing the imagination of the Australian public with a car which had quality and design that had not before been seen in an Australian product. But at that stage, no one knew what Ford had up their sleeve. And when Ford did release their XD Falcon, codenamed Blackwood, everybody was immediately most enthusiastic about it, to the extent that, within months, those two cars, the XD Falcon and the Holden Commodore, were sharing market lead almost on a month-by-month -month basis, once with Ford leading and then once with General Motors leading. The reason was simple enough. Ford's XD was slightly closer to the Australian tradition of the family car, that is a little bigger than the Holden Commodore. Very roomy, very spacious, very well conceived and designed. Ford's 3.3 litre engine is interesting in the fact that it even exists. It seems to me to be a fairly well kept secret and I'm sure there are a lot of people who don't know that Ford make a 3.3 litre engine. Traditionally it's been sold to cab and hire car operators and to some fleet operators. There's never been a great deal of pressure from the sales or marketing staff to sell the 3.3 litre engine to the consumer. And uh, I guess that's probably because there is a tendency for everybody to be convinced that they need to have the 4.1 litre six-cylinder engine or the 4.9 litre V8. And in fact, that simply is not true. We've elected to use the 3.3 litre engine for the very reason of being able to prove that the small six will do almost everything that the other engines will do perfectly adequately, with one possible exception, which I'll get to in just a few moments. In this case, we've elected to couple it to the optional four-speed manual transmission rather than the three-speed column shift, which simply is not as good to use, nor does it provide the flexibility of gear ratios that one needs with the slightly smaller capacity engine. I've begun this test in touring conditions because that's traditionally what these large cars were built for. And the first thing I have to tell you is that the 3.3 litre engine handles this sort of motoring excellently. But I must also tell you that it will not be hurried, no matter how you try to stir it along. There is no way that it could be called a hot performer. But that's probably no bad thing, both from an economy and a safety point of view. The other main area of concern with long distance touring is driver and passenger comfort and here the Ford comes up well. You sit high and firm and the long wheelbase just cruises effortlessly over dips and humps. Added to this, the steering is light and positive. Wherever you go touring in Australia, you're going to meet up with rough bitumen and dirt. And in either situation, the Falcon does have a problem. The back axle is not effectively located and dampened. And in rough conditions, it actually bounces up and down. And you can sense that the rear of the car is moving about more than it ought to. That's something that can and must be cured. Otherwise, the overall road holding and handling are excellent and the car handles rapid changes of direction neatly and easily. And it brakes just as well as the Commodore. No unnecessary lockup and no directional instability. For most of us, the majority of our driving is done in cities and suburbs, where ease of operation is almost more important than out on the open road. In these conditions, you'll notice two things. 
The first is that the gearbox and transmission generally are really excellent. Without a doubt, the best I've ever used in a big car of any kind. A very light clutch, one which is so easy to use that there is just no justification for going to automatic transmissions. And quite literally, a fingertip gear shift mechanism, which I find quite delightful to use. And nobody could have any complaints about it whatsoever. The second point is that it has a very large area of glass, and that's both an advantage and a disadvantage. An advantage from the safety viewpoint, because you have excellent visibility, but a slight disadvantage from the comfort viewpoint, because it lets in so much sunlight that the car tends to get very hot and stuffy. That, in turn, makes one think of air conditioning, and that means even less economy. If I were asked to make a preference between the Falcon and the Commodore, I guess I'd have to say the Falcon. In fact, the two cars are just about equal in a great many departments. Handling, for example, although the Commodore might have an edge as far as dirt's concerned. So that the preference seems to be in a somewhat subjective area. The Falcon certainly is a more pleasant car to drive, principally, I think, because of what I've already described as being an absolutely marvellous transmission, clutch and gearbox particularly. In other areas, they are comparable, and in one area particularly, they both have a problem. That's in the problem of fuel efficiency. The Falcon has an engine of 3.3 litres, which is only about half a litre bigger than that of the Commodore, in a package which is overall just a little heavier, yet they both manage to return the same fuel consumption figures of around 17 to 19 miles per gallon, or 15 or 16 litres per 100 kilometres somewhere in that figure, again, depending on tune and the way you drive and all those other contingency factors that will affect your economy. Neither of which, in fact, is good enough, but it does suggest a marginal efficiency benefit as far as Falcon is concerned. When you consider town driving, however, we, we know that we must be able to achieve better than that, and particularly in view of the fact that, as you'll recall, the BMW was giving in the vicinity of six miles per gallon better than that figure. So there's still a long way to go there. One final little disappointment. Despite having come up with a completely new design, the Ford Motor Company have still managed to bury the spare wheel at the bottom of the boot, beneath all of this luggage. And although you don't get flat tyres very often, it almost always happens while you're on holidays and while you have a boot as full as this one. And that presents some problems for you. Which, in fact, brings us to our next story. I mentioned earlier that cars are getting smaller, an obvious fact, I guess, but one point arises from that which most people may not have considered. You still will take the same sort of holidays and you will need on those holidays the same sort of luggage and probably even more because you might have to take blankets or sheets or whatever. And you'll find as a result of the gradual reduction in the size of cars that you are able to carry less and less, unless, of course, you find some sort of alternative method of carrying all that equipment. And that's what we're going to look at right now. In the first place, you could use a roof rack. The first style of these are just simply two bars like this one, originally designed simply to take a pair of snow skis, water skis or a surfboard, but they will take a little more than that. Certainly they'll take anything which is flat and which is not too heavy because they're not designed to take a great deal of weight. And besides, anything that sags in the middle is going to do damage to your roof. This is the more conventional style of roof rack, which people see around quite a lot. And in fact, you can load quite a lot onto a roof rack, and some people consistently load far too much onto roof racks. Now, an interesting point about roof racks. In a period in history where we are heavily into fuel conservation, a roof rack, even unladen, will give you a fuel penalty of somewhere in the vicinity of $70 for each 16,000 kilometres that you drive. And if it were consistently with a load upon it, that fuel penalty would be in the vicinity of $220 for each 16,000 kilometres that you drive. And the reason is simple enough. That creates drag. 
a great deal more than you would have if the car was just in its normal form slippery through the air. Thus, you're going to have to pay if you want to carry the extra load on top of the car. One of the answers to that problem then is to bring your additional luggage down from the roof and attach it to the back of the car, which people have been doing for years, in fact, in trailers of one kind or another. But uh, your average trailer doesn't lend itself to any sort of reasonable touring whatsoever because they tend to bounce and jump all over the road and also because they are difficult to manoeuvre and back with and simply a lot of people don't like them and can't handle them whatsoever. Perhaps this is changing all that. This is a new concept of trailer with just one single wheel. It is very light, very manoeuvrable, and it has the capacity to do things that you can't do with a normal trailer, but what it's like on the back of the car, we'll find out in just a moment. This little trailer is firstly different from other trailers in that it doesn't pivot from the gooseneck of the tow bar. It has a pin to locate it there so that its relationship to the vehicle is always in this sort of parallel situation and any movement is conducted by the single rear wheel which is also casted so that you are supposed to be able to reverse with it and whether you can we'll find out in a moment. And secondly, the lid is removable completely and also lockable which is an advantage if you've got valuables inside on a touring exercise for example. Uh, as well, the whole of this box can be removed from the base of the frame, meaning that you could use that frame to transport other things. Now, there could be some difficulties with all of that, and they're the sort of things that will reveal themselves only when we're driving. First impressions of what's affectionately known as the big boot luggage carrier in terms of its mobility is how laterally stable it is. Because it doesn't pivot from the back of the vehicle, there is none of the hunting movement that you sometimes get with trailers. And in fact, you honestly would have no idea that it was there at all in that sense. However, there is one other point. It does move vertically. That is, it jumps up and down quite a lot, particularly unladen. That can be overcome as it happens, I would suggest, in a manner which I'll describe in just a moment. I would have to say that that's not untypical of trailers though because over the years there's been very poor developmental work done on trailers and none of them trail very well when they're unladen. They're all designed to carry heavy loads and when you trail with them empty they jump and skip all over the road. Now normal trailers will also move a great deal sideways when they're jumping and skipping. This one then has an advantage in that sense at least, meaning that it's not going to fling itself out into a lane of opposing traffic. That's an interesting point. I've just made a, a classic mistake. I'm used to backing trailers and caravans, as most people are, which pivot from the back of the car, meaning that you always begin your turn by turning in the opposite direction to get the trailer to move. In this case, you don't do that. You just turn in the normal direction because it's this wheel which changes direction with you. Uh, for, for a moment, I was tricked by that. 
once you become used to it, it makes it easier because you don't have to think about turning in the opposite direction. The only thing you've got to remember is that you've got a fair amount of length there, but otherwise it will just manoeuvre and follow you wherever you go. That's really quite good. Now, insofar as this suspension thing is concerned, this trailer particularly tends to lend itself to this sort of progressive rate controlled suspension design. I know why it isn't there. It's not there because of the simplicity of the design and because of low cost manufacture. But it could be improved, for example, by breaking it there, making that a pivot point, and then adding, for example, a three leaf quarter elliptic spring, each leaf slightly separated and of slightly varying thickness so that the first leaf was a very thin, soft leaf, which would take whatever weight there was when it was unladen, and the second leaf would pick up as the spring rate compressed with load, and the third one progressively once again until it was fully laden. And then to control that, a small telescopic gas-filled or hydraulic-filled shock absorber of some kind. Quite simple, but probably it would add a bit to the cost, and I guess that's why it hasn't been done. But it would make the big boot luggage carrier very effective indeed, and very good value for doing the sort of things that we've been talking about in terms of your holiday luggage travel. Speaking of holidays and of luggage and trailers and various things, it quite logically leads to the other form of popular Australian trailer, and that is caravans. And just before we get to caravans, one other point comes up, which we didn't mention, which has to do with the Falcon itself, and that is that there is still this standing belief in Australia that to pull any sort of caravan or large boat, you must have a great big hulking V8. And that is simply not true, and in this case, we're pulling a caravan of quite reasonable size with this 3.3 litre engine and doing it fairly comfortably. And now back to the caravan. The caravan industry in the last year or so has come in for some criticism and people who insist on using caravans for their holidays have equally been criticised because of this fuel problem and conservation. But let me say right now that despite that criticism it is still possible for a family of four people to take a caravan holiday less expensively than any other form known so far in Australia and particularly if that alternative is to take your car somewhere and stay in motels or alternatively even leave your car at home and catch aeroplanes. So what's the movement within the caravan industry and uh, what the movement is is attached to the back of this car. Pop tops are the going thing at the moment and one of the latest in pop tops is the Franklin which is a little different from most in that rather than having canvas sides, it has aluminium panels. The most important thing is that the pop top lowers the roof line of the van, decreases the drag, and provided that it's not a huge van, also manages to compress the weight overall so you're not pulling anything that's going to substantially increase your fuel consumption. All of which means that caravans are still on, provided that you select carefully. This one tows beautifully, and it does so without spring bars or any sort of tricks on the tow bar to give it stability. And it does that principally because it's less wind affected than most vans because of that lower roof line. It handles delightfully. What it's like inside is something we'll take a look at now. Right, so we know that it trails well, we know that it's reasonably economical to operate, and we also know that it only takes a few minutes to put it up. What other features does it have that it might contribute to you? 
Bear in mind, most caravan manufacturers make claims about their caravans which are a little unrealistic in terms of the sleeping capacity of the van. This one, at least, has no pretenses in that area. It tells you, and it's right, that you can sleep just two people. So what am I doing talking about family holidays? Well, bear in mind that your kids probably would love to sleep in a tent just outside the door, and there's no reason in the world why they shouldn't. That's comfortable, and it's also very inexpensive. As far as features are concerned, pretty terrific really and highly mobile. That becomes a little wardrobe when you stack it up. It has a gas electric refrigerator, it has a stove, it has a dishwashing area and it has plenty of bench space. So ideally it's got all the comforts of home in a package that is economical, reasonable to use and seems to me to have a lot of benefits. And while we're on the subject of pop tops, here's another kind of pop top. Tops are the latest things in sports cars as well. Campbell Bolwell from Victoria has been trying to build a classic Australian sports car for years and with some modest degree of success. This is his latest creation. This is the Bulwell Acara, and with it, Campbell Bulwell has come full circle. He began some 15 years ago building kit cars, and then progressed to a production line, a small production line, but a production line which produced the fairly well-known Bulwell Nagari, which of course became much too expensive to produce in Australia, so back to kit cars again. Just let me define a kit car. It is, in fact, a car which you buy the components for, and then assemble at home, in your own workshop, in your own garage, in your own backyard if you like. It means that, that you can spread the assembly time over a period of time and do it very well, and that relieves Campbell Bowl with the responsibility for the quality of the finished product, because what it looks like when it's completed is pretty much up to you. Now, it's an interesting little car, and it raises some eyebrows in the street, either a great deal of uproarious laughter, or a lot of general interest, but whatever, intriguing glances which indicate that a lot of people would like to own it. This is the prototype Bolwell Acara. That means that it's the first. And for that reason, I expect to find some lack of refinement here and there and some things that need modification. But just let me explain the basic configuration of the car first. The engine transmission unit is transverse, as it so commonly is in a lot of passenger cars these days. That is, it sits across the car rather than laterally in that manner. In this case, it's the Volkswagen Golf 1.6 engine, but you could also use Honda Civic, Honda Accord, even Mini, if you like, any of those cars which have transverse mounted engines. And that's one of the joys of being able to make a kit car. You can elect to use various different components. It sits very neatly in there, but on looking down and examining, one thing terrifies me straight away. I know it's always a problem to provide linkages for gear shift mechanisms in cars where the shift mechanism is so remote from the gearbox itself. And down there, there is a sequence of linkages which terrifies me. And what that'll be like, heaven only knows. Like all prototypes, the ball wall has a certain lack of refinement, especially those prototypes which are handmade. It's understandable they are, after all, very largely experimental. And therefore, I see it as my function to ignore some of that and at least consider the car on its merits, or at least on its potential merits, in the sense that this is what it could be. Now, there we have a problem. sort of problem that's not uncommon in prototypes and particularly in view of those sort of gear shift linkages I've just described to you. Very hard to get gears and uh, I hope that's fixed, in fact I'm sure it will be and also uh, straight away this belt is rubbing my neck which suggests that the mounting point should be slightly lower down.
before getting into detail, let's look at the Bowlwell's good points first. The driving position is excellent and the seating is very comfortable, which it needs to be because the suspension is somewhat harsher than your average saloon. This is, after all, a sports car. One nice point is that the suspension is so designed that you can play around with it a bit and build in the settings that you want. The instrumentation is comprehensive, giving you all the information you need, and the Golf engine is, of course, excellent and ideally suited to a car as light as this one. And when you want to stop, there are four-wheel discs adjustable for front or rear bias. The whole thing creaks and groans a bit, but that's common in a space frame car with body panels which flex easily. Given that the prototype idiosyncrasies will be removed, this car certainly is great fun to drive and complements the sort of driver who enjoys what he's doing. Inevitably, there are some criticisms to be made of all prototype cars and to justify them is difficult because you know that a lot of what you're going to say is going to change. Nevertheless, it's worth repeating some of those things and because there are a lot of them, I've made a little list, principally because I think if you intend to buy one of these, even if the intention is to build it and assemble it yourself, some of the components will need to take this sort of configuration and you need to know. We've already mentioned the gear shift mechanism and really is, it is very bad indeed and needs to be almost entirely redesigned. Okay, the handbrake is badly located. It's very high up here and I see no reason why it could not be relocated down beside the gear shift lever which would make it easier to get at. And again, I have to repeat, don't think about it as being a, a, a parking brake, think about it as being a secondary safety brake that you need to be able to get at. It's important that we should separate the brake and the accelerator pedal. They're too close together and it's possible to get your foot onto both pedals at the same time. And in fact, the same thing applies to the clutch and, and brake pedal which are also too close together. We've got to lift the brake pedal to be on the same plane as the accelerator pedal. It is at about an inch and a half lower and there's no reason for it to be. The gear shift lever in third and top gear rests against the leg. It needs a slight crank so that it's not touching the leg. A little bit of angle in it, in fact. We've got to relocate the, or change completely, the uh, wiper switch which hits your knuckles when you're turning the steering wheel. It's an interference that you can well and truly do without. We've got to drop this top seat belt mount, as I mentioned, because it rubs on your neck. We've got to put in a wider rear view mirror, which will take in the whole of the back window rather than just two thirds of it. And I'm not sure about this steering wheel. I hope it's just a prototype steering wheel, but it's not a very nice steering wheel. And I wouldn't like to have to have a car with one as badly made as that. And we need to have a footrest for the left leg when it's not being used on the clutch, because otherwise it just floats about inside the cabin here. OK, I repeat, probably Bol will have looked after all of those things already. But I bring them up so that you know that if you intend to have one of these cars, that's what you need to look for. And now I need to say one thing more. You may well ask what justification there is in this period in history for somebody like Campbell Bolwell to build a car like this. Just because motoring is becoming expensive, there is no reason why it should not also continue to be enjoyable. And there are still plenty of people around who love to drive, who take their driving very seriously, and who would like to be able to buy a sporty style of car without spending $35,000, or $50,000. This gives you the opportunity to do that, and I believe it's justified for that reason alone. It's also worthwhile mentioning that up until recently, everybody who wanted a GT-style GT car has had to go for a super powerful V8 of some kind to get the sort of performance they're looking for, and thus 10 or 12 or 13 miles per gallon, whereas this car has the capacity to provide much better economy than that. So far as cost is concerned, it's impossible for me to say. It depends on how you build it. Somewhere between six and $12,000, and the degree of luxury is almost entirely up to you. That's all for this week. Next week, we take a look at Chrysler Mitsubishi's Valiant and Sigma to complete our look at a so-called Big Three of Australia. Good night. Next on ABC Tonight, more bright ideas from those clever people, the inventors. But before that, see how clever you are. What do Mike Walsh, Malcolm Johnston and June Bronhill have in common? 
Well, apart from being three of Australia's leading celebrities, each one is the guest of Michael Parkinson this week. A star-studded lineup for Parkinson in Australia, 7.30 Saturday on ABC.